We'll open now for questions. In the back, Wes Bonifay. I enjoyed the, the, the presentation. Uh, I agree with you that God is not misogynistic, but uh, like Shai said, there are many difficult passages. And one that comes to mind for me, uh, and I guess this is a two-part question. When we, when we read the story of Lot, Lot is in Sodom, and he has two angels accompanying him, and the men of Sodom, uh, the New King James says, the men say, send those men out so we may know them carnally. And Lot says, no, don't, don't take them. And he gives his daughters instead. And he says, take my daughters. And he says, do with them as you, as you want. And by modern definitions, that seems pretty misogynistic to treat his daughters as property, to treat their sexuality as a commodity that he has control over. So my first question is, is that misogynistic? And then my second question is, in Peter's second letter, he praises Lot, and he calls Lot a righteous man. And so how are we to reconcile that in the New Testament, we read that someone who showed what is a difficult thing to understand, giving up your daughters like that, is praised as someone that we should look up to as a righteous person? Those are good questions. And I, I think I'll have to say he was misogynistic there. And that comes back to the principles that I set down at first, and there's a difference in man's perspective perspective, even godly men, and he was godly in some respects, and I'll answer that in just a moment, and God's perspective. Uh, what he did, I believe, was wrong for him to do that. And of course, the angels saved him and saved them, really, when they pulled him back in, you know. But, you know, a lot of the commentators, I think Adam Clark and some others, say that this was, in that culture, in that time, if you had a guest in your house, you were to save them at all costs. I mean, even if it meant, like in Lot's case, giving up his daughters or giving up your life, you protected your guest. And so that's not a justification for it, but it uh, perhaps is the reason that he did that, because we think, how could he do that? That didn't even make sense. But it had to do with that culture, and maybe it had to do, too, with the fact that he just didn't think as much of his daughters as he should have, which is kind of hard to believe. Now, I don't know if that answers that, but on the second part, over there where Peter said, uh, just Lot was vexed by the wickedness of the people of, Lot, of uh, Sodom day by day. And we see that in the story. When the angels come into town, he's sitting in the gate. And as soon as he meets them, he knows the people of Sodom. He knows how they are. And he tells those men, it's not safe to stay in the streets. Come into my house. So he's sitting out there to take in wary strangers and to protect them. And so I think what Peter's saying there is, I don't think he's referring to that incident about his daughters. But he's saying that Lot knew how wicked they were. Now he pitched his tent towards Sodom, and now he's over there. But he knows how they are, and he's vexed. And the word vexed means it, it's irksome to him. These people are awful. And of course, the question comes up, why don't you leave them? Well, he couldn't. His wife wouldn't leave. And uh, his daughters and sons-in-law. and so, But he hated the place after he got there and saw. And so he was a righteous man in that sense that he hated their wickedness and he was trying to protect these strangers. But I can't, uh, unless somebody else has a better explanation, I can't justify. He was a misogynist in that incident, it seems to me. I don't know how else to, to, to answer that part. Clint to France. I was very helpful to see, of course that shouldn't surprise us, we know very many Old Testament stories that men of God were not always godly in every respect. Not even Abraham was always godly. Uh, so that's, that deals with a lot of those difficult stories. But sometimes in the law, you've got some difficult statements. And I've got three that I'd like for you to consider. There were more. I think we sent you a list of some, but I'd like you to, to say what you could about these three. You only get one question, I think, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we had two parts, so. <laughs> okay, so two of them are in Leviticus chapter 19. In verse 20, the Bible talks about uh, somebody who lies carnally with a woman who's been betrothed to a man as a concubine. 
and uh, who has not been redeemed nor given her freedom, then the person should be scourged, but if but they shall not be put to death because she was not free. And that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the the rights of the woman. This woman uh, is being considered a piece of property. So that Leviticus 19. That's Leviticus 19 and verse 20. Uh, one other in this chapter, and you can consider these two, uh, verse 29 that says, Do not prostitute your daughter to cause her to be a harlot, lest the land fall into harlotry and the land become full of wickedness. And I've heard people bring this up and they say, Well, look at that. They're not concerned about the daughter. They're just concerned about what it's going to do to the country. doesn't matter uh, for, the, for the daughter's sake. He doesn't even mention her. So how would you mention those two? Well, again, God accommodated himself. This is the only way I know to answer it. Is God accommodated the law because of the hardness of their hearts and because they, they treated women, as we've said. And they did treat them as uh, property sometimes and as chattel or whatever the case might be. And so God's law was given to protect the family and to protect the woman. I'm not sure. Where is it? Leviticus 19 and verse 20. So she's a concubine, which means she's a servant wife. She's not a free woman in that sense. Again, there's something God, that was not God's ideal plan. So here's this woman who's a slave, and he lies with her. Well, you know, in many, perhaps, and I'm just kind of doing off the cuff now, perhaps in some cultures, nothing would be done. She's a slave. He, he lies with her. So what? She says, that man raped me. So what? You're a slave. But God says, the man's to be scourged, not put to death, but he's to be scourged. And she was a slave woman. So it seems to me that even there, God's protecting her. You better think about this. Here's a concubine, a slave woman. And you're going to go and, if he's talking about rape or whatever, he's maybe consensual, whatever. Seems like he's talking about something forcible, though. And you force her, and then she complains about that. You can get scourged for that. So there's kind of a deterrent, isn't there, against doing that. So God's accommodating, and this is not the ideal but he's accommodating to that situation. Does that sound right, or what do you think? I think nothing. <laughs> you've, you've been studying this for two years. <laughs> I was hoping to get that. No, I think that that makes sense. I mean, That's the only thing. That an answer? Yeah. Uh, what about what was the, the other one? one in verse uh, 29, where it seems that the reason he opposes putting your daughter into prostitution is because of the effect it will have on the land instead of mentioning anything about the girl. Well, again, it seems to me that just, he's just saying, don't hire your daughter out as a prostitute because uh, it'll spread. If you do it, then other people will do it and the whole country will be... It's kind of like 1 Corinthians 5 where here's a man who's immoral and we're to withdraw from that man to save him. But that's not the only thing involved here. He says, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out that old leaven. So we're concerned about the man, but even if he won't repent, we're concerned about his influence in the church and the reputation of the church. So wouldn't that be what he's saying here? Don't uh, prostitute out your daughter. And you would think, how could they do that? How did anybody even think about that? But that's what God was having to deal with. So he's having to, con he's having to protect these women, accommodating to the hardness of their hearts and their wickedness. And we know how wicked they were and how wicked they got. And so he says, uh, you will not sell your daughter into prostitution. If you do that, the whole country is going to be... It's kind of like uh, we might say, you know, uh, one reason we were opposed to uh, legalization of gay marriage is because we think it's wrong, but also look at the influence it's going to have on our children and grandchildren. What well, we've got to deal with. Our country is going to pot because of this. So isn't that what he's saying here? Don't go down this road because the whole country will be uh, corrupted. I guess basically the point is that all of this is accommodative to a culture that already mistreated women and God's trying to, to temper it. If he maybe had said something that was a little bit more restrictive, they would have just completely ignored it altogether. That's probably know. right. Same way with slavery. And of course, slavery was not exactly the same 
in the Old Testament as it was in the United States. It was, you know, a person would go into servitude because they were in debt or whatever. But instead, if God had said, you can't have any slaves at all, they would have rebelled. I mean, they wouldn't have accepted that. You can't divorce your wife at all. Jesus said He allowed it because of the hardness here. God accommodated until Jesus came, and now we have the perfect law of liberty. And of course, that's the critics too say, what about that slavery in the Old Testament, you know? Well, God accompanied, but He protected the slave. They couldn't just beat them indiscriminately. They couldn't just sell them indiscriminately. They had to be kind to their uh, slaves, or they were punished because of that. Had to pay a fine or whatever. So here were these people who were so corrupt, so their nature was so corrupted that the law was given on, because of transgressions until the seed came. So it circumscribed and protected people. But it was not God's ideal. And that's the only way I know to explain Well, I've that. got one I'm more. Deep. Okay. And I'm going to just paraphrase this one because uh, it's kind of graphic. But, of course, atheists, will they don't care about that. They'll just quote it graphically. But there's a passage in uh, Deuteronomy that talks about if a woman sees someone attacking her husband and she runs up to stop the attacker and touches him in a compromising way. They're to cut off her hand and show her no mercy or sympathy. And that's one I, that has been quoted to me, and of course it's kind of abrasive. Anyway, maybe you could say something about that. Well, I remember reading that. Was that one of the questions? May have been. I kind of ignored the questions, hoping they wouldn't come up, but they did. <laughs> I don't want to be too graphic either, but from what I've read, I remember seeing that, and I remember going and looking at it, and she didn't just touch him. She hurt him. So, I mean, here's her husband. They're in a fight, and she comes up and grabs him and hurt I mean, really does damage to him. Maybe irreparable damage where he can't have any children. Then her hand was to be uh, cut off, it says. If that's, and so it wasn't just that she knocked him in the head with a pipe or something. She damaged him so that he could not have children, and that was so important in that culture. And so th these were laws given to a nation, and these were people who were so degenerate, and all these things, and we see still this, we see this degenerate, the same thing today. And so God gave these laws. It was not the ideal. He accommodated until Jesus came. Now these things don't apply in the kingdom. And it was never God's ideal. And that's the only way I know to, exp to uh, explain it. Just wanted to quickly comment about the prostitution in, Le in Leviticus 19. We, here at Rice Road, we studied the book of Leviticus a couple of years ago. And it, you'll notice in the context immediately around verse 29, for example, verse 27, you shall not shave around the sides of your head, nor shall you disfigure the uh, edges of your beard, and uh, the next verse has to do with cuttings and tattoos. Uh, the context here is, I, I believe, idolatrous practices. These are all elements of pagan idol worship that were probably common among the Canaanites. God's preparing the people for what they're going to encounter. And I think the prostitution here is probably temple prostitution or idolatrous prostitution. So the fear is not corruption necessarily from a moral perspective, that a bunch of women in Israel are going to become prostitutes. The fear is corruption religiously, that if uh, men allow their women, because uh, among the Canaanites, uh, idol prostitution was a, that was a highly regarded position. That was something to uh, aspire towards. And so the fear was religious defilement, uh, among the people that the idolatrous practices of the Canaanites would become a scourge and a plague upon Israel, and they'd be led away. And he's saying, don't let your daughters get involved uh, in even something that might be lauded as appealing in the land of Canaan. Don't let your daughters be involved in anything like that, because that corruption will spread through the whole land. I think that's good. And that brings up, and I, I might as well bring it up, one of the questions, and I asked Shahe, because you guys did go through that, asked Shahe and and Dr. Shaw about this, and so they can elaborate on this, and I told them I wanted them to if it came up, is when a woman had a male child, she was unclean for uh, 40 days. 
But if she had a female child, she was unclean for 80 days. Now, some of the scholars had all kinds of different ideas. But some of them had, they said, had to do with uh, that very thing. That among the Canaanites, uh, women were used as prostitutes and uh, female fertility rites. And so this was to show that the woman, the female was, of course the children weren't unclean, but it was 80 days in, in some way to discourage them from, from that. But y'all had a different take on that, but uh, if you want to share I'll that. I'll leave that for Bart. So okay. <laughs> we'll, let's table that because we have several questions, then we'll come around back to that. So Roger Boone is next. Jerry, I just had a question. You defined the word misogyny and the word miso as hatred. And I'm not sure if, and, and I'm not sure, if you looked up Webster's Dictionary, if misogyny would say hatred of women. But suppose it did. Uh, some of the things that, uh, and I'm thinking the New Testament more than the Old Testament, just because we recognize a difference doesn't imply hatred. Hatred implies emotion and feeling as well as action. And so uh, we wouldn't, we, we, we believe the Bible teaches that women aren't allowed to teach the Bible publicly. And some people might call us misogynists. They do. Because of that. Yeah. But that word, but the word misogyny is a word that, because of the hatred issue, carries prejudice with it. Right. Uh, and I would, you know, I don't think we would accept the word misogyny. Uh, at, it's not hatred. There's, there's something else that's going on, and I think we understand that, but it's not hatred. In fact, the blessing of your lesson is to show that we love women. Right. And the Bible and God loves women. And uh, to accept that, or even to, you know, to use the word misogyny, either it has a different definition than hatred in common language, or we shouldn't accept that. Word. Well, certainly we don't. Uh, yeah. I mean, we don't accept misogyny. We don't hate women. The, the point is that critics of the Bible and critics of us, because we won't let women be elders and lead the singing and all that, they say we're misogynist. You know, but we're not. It's a misunderstanding on their part. I think that's... But the word does mean the hatred or the... Uh, of women. But we're not. We, we're not. They say we are, but we're not. Jeremy Smith. For those that would say that uh, some of the people of God were misogynists, especially in the Old Testament, I'd like to ask this question. King David was referred to as a man after God's own heart, yet he basically, it appears, forced himself upon Bathsheba in Second uh, Samuel, the 11th chapter. So somebody that would say he used his influence and power to extort her in that situation um, and that uh, they weren't stoned to death uh, after that, would, it would appear that um, there was some misogyny going on. What would be your response to that? Well, it's not clear if he forced himself on her. I know it says that he saw her, then he inquired, then he sent for her, and, she, and I, it says she came in unto him. And I've always thought that they were both complicit. She was out there bathing herself in public. And she must have known, I would think, that David could see her. And then he sent for her. But if, if she resisted, there's no indication. She came to him. So they had what I would call, what we call an affair. Now, maybe he was the king. Maybe she felt like she couldn't resist. Or maybe that was an appeal, you know, to her. So I don't know if he was a misogynist in that since there, he had ten wives, though. Concubines are plenty, the Bible says. So women were just uh, for the use of the man, generally. I mean, and of course that was the problem. And that's why God gave some of this legislation about divorce and remarriage. You can't just throw them away, you know. Michael Conway. Go back to Lot when he was talking about anyone that come into their home was protected at all costs. Well, that's still even true today in Afghanistan and Pakistan, not just in their home, but if they're in a tribe, they usually uh, will do at all costs. I just watched a program on that. 
uh, that they would follow through to take care of them. So that's just a side note on that, that they did do that then and they still do that now over in the Middle East. But secondly, wouldn't you say that um, when people would say, or feminists or whoever would say we're misogynists, would say that uh, we are misogynists because we do not allow women to be preachers, teachers, elders, and so forth, couldn't we also point out that we as men cannot be elders or deacons without the women That's true. themselves and show how that elevates women. Without them, we can't have that office, and they, like we, have to meet that qualification. And so that shows that we each have roles on an equal playing field or plane. That's right. That's true. Women have a different role. That doesn't mean they're inferior. They are in the eyes of men, but they're not inferior, not less intelligent, but they have different roles in the church and in the home. So, comment more than question, I presume. Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. So that is a special warning to men not to be harsh or cruel, which are appearances of hatred, and yet no one's to be bitter toward anybody. In the same context, husbands, uh, wives are told to be submissive, but everybody's supposed to be submissive. And I think what's being referred to there is that the a temptation of relationships for wives, one of the larger temptations is to not properly occupy their role, and one of the bigger temptations for husbands is to take advantage of theirs. And so there can be a harshness. Now, with Lot, due to the circumstance of the culture of Sodom, while we are just horrified by him offering his daughters, there wasn't much risk in doing so. Well, good point. <laughs> okay. And as bad as that sounds, as bad as that sounds, yes, he still did it, but it is a reminder of what happens in relationships when there are issues of submission to God because Lot struggled to occupy his proper place in his home or he would have turned around and instead of pitching his tent toward, he would have next been pitching his tent away. But it takes two in that relationship. And this appears that he was trying to be who he should be in the midst of an impossible situation. And not just Lot in Sodom, but there are a lot of people today in relationship issues who get themselves involved in such a can of worms that there are no good decisions left for their relationship. And you look at Lot as a desperate man, he would have been better off just saying, kill me. We would have looked upon him with more respect than to have offered his daughters. And whether or not it was the culture to protect your guests, you have to say, at what cost? And so... He was in a place where he shouldn't be. And sometimes when people are in places where they shouldn't be, they want us preachers to try to help them advise which daughter they should offer to the world. And the answer is neither one. Get out of that situation. Find a way out. And sometimes it appears there is no way out. But the Lord did provide a way out. That's good. Lot, and I guess they were too hard. He was a pitiful character. I mean, they had to drag him out. Then his wife turned to a pillar of salt. Then he gets up on the mountain, you know. He goes from one extreme to the other. He won't let his daughters go into town. But they, they think we have to have children. They get him drunk. and So his own daughters, he sleeps with his own daughters. And 
It's just a tragic story because he got into the wrong place and the wrong situation. That's right. So maybe we can come back to the middle part of Leviticus for a minute. Um, Leviticus 11 through 15 are some of the more challenging chapters in the law of Moses. And uh, Leviticus 8, 9, and 10 is the consecration of the priests and the sin of Nadab and Abihu. And then from there, uh, the book of Leviticus dives into several very lengthy chapters uh, that deal primarily with clean and unclean situations. So Leviticus 11 deals with food, animals. And Leviticus 11 is like 47 verses long. It is a huge chapter about this lizard is unclean and this bird is clean and you can eat this and you can't eat this. And it's very laborious just to read. But if we understand, I think, what God is trying to teach, for for example, we can look to the book of Acts to see why God went through all of that. And in the book of Acts, in, in Acts chapter 10, God uses the idea of clean and unclean animals to reveal to Peter that he is accepting of the Gentiles. Don't call anything uh, unclean, which God has called clean, which God has accepted. So the point of Leviticus 11 was to illustrate some sort of spiritual reality. Now, there was a physical reality of the regulations, right? They had to abstain from eating certain types of animals. But it was, it was meant to teach them something. It was meant to teach them a spiritual concept. And I think the same is true for Leviticus 12. Leviticus 12 is a very difficult short chapter. And there are, I think, two difficult parts of Leviticus 12. The first part is the fact that a woman would be unclean after having a child. And as you presented, when the Bible talks about motherhood and children... It uses beautiful and lofty language to describe the blessedness of children. Why would a woman be unclean after having a child? And then the second difficult issue is, why was she unclean longer for having a baby girl than for having a baby boy? So there's something here that God is trying to teach Israel. And one of the conclusions that we came to in our study of the book of Leviticus was that perhaps Leviticus 12 is a reflection of the curse that uh, Eve brought upon herself and upon Adam dreadful curses as a result of their sin, as we learned the other night. And so Leviticus 12 maybe is a way to remind the people of the curse. And what was the curse predominantly for the woman? The curse was the multiplication of pain and sorrow in childbirth. So all of this maybe is a, is a reminder of the devastating consequences of sin, as Billy taught us earlier when, in relation to animal sacrifice. These things reminded the children of Israel of the bitterness of the curses of sin and the strain that sin puts upon the people. And so you have all these very intricate laws in that middle section of Leviticus that all remind the people how easy it is to fall under the curse of sin and how difficult it is to come out of that through animal sacrifice, through purification, through washing, and all of these ceremonies that were required of them. So the reason that she was unclean 80 days, twice as long with a girl, is because the woman led in the transgression. Is that's that's of that? a possible so, interpretation, yeah. And maybe Bar has something more he'd like to add to that. Uh, Okay, and then Clint for our last question. Yeah, I agree completely. I don't have much to say because we're running late. But uh, I think a corollary in 1 Timothy 2 is the verse 15 that we often discuss. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, holiness with self-control. And as Shah has pointed out, it's, and I like what Greg said about submission. It's all about submission. The, the nation of Israel is a nation of men and women, Adam and Eve. So they're at little Adam and Eve. And, so, and we are too. We have the tendency to revolt and to uh, leave God's uh, teaching and God's will and to pl- plot our own course. And we have to be reminded constantly 
to come back to God, come back to his teaching, and to be in submission to that. And I think all of the Levitical uh, regulations are really just a reminder. The woman is to be reminded. There's nothing biologically unclean about menstrual period or about having a baby. Uh, those, that's not, it's, and it's a misstatement. It's a bad misstatement when a preacher or a teacher gets in the pulpit and says there's a medical reason. No medical Many reason of the commentators that. said that, that I looked yeah. at. Yeah. I think that is, that's why that's I asked you. That's misconstruing and misstating the scripture. It's pointing back to Genesis 3 as our brother Clint covered first. Clint, for our last question. Well, I'll be very brief. I just didn't follow up to the questions I asked. I wanted to commend the way that you presented this. It's very helpful for me to see the huge positive picture. None of us, when we read about Abraham lying, think, well, God must approve of lying. God must hate truth, because here's a, a man in the Bible who tells a lie. We know that Abraham was doing something wrong. It's just the same way. When, when we learn how much God loves women, then we will read all of his other passages in light of that truth, which I know was your, your overarching point, and I thought that was an excellent point. One other thing I'll say is for the many verses that are specifically attacked on this issue, there's a great book that was written in the last few years by a man named Paul Copen. The book is called, Is God a Moral Monster? And I would recommend people to get that book, and he will systematically respond to all of these difficult passages and does as good of a job as anyone, I think, has ever written on the subject. You suggest, when you all gave me this uh, topic, you suggested I get that book, and I did, and it is a great book. It really is. I want to say one more thing, about, and we're getting late. Like I said, you refer to that passage where that she shall, I think it's the same passage, she'll be saved in childbearing. Is that the one where she, it says if she's not afraid with any amazement? Or is that... Uh, and I often wonder, what does that mean if she's not afraid? Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you're not afraid with many amazement. And I got to thinking, maybe this is the meaning. Abraham lied. You talked about Abraham lying. He was afraid. He got over there in Egypt and he got in the Philistine country and she was fair and he was afraid for his own life. But Sarah, I think what that passage means is she was not afraid. She trusted God. And even when uh, they took her into the harem, she wasn't afraid. Abraham was afraid, but she wasn't. She was better than Abraham in that sense. Seems to me that's what he's saying. And you sisters are daughters of Sarah if you're not afraid, if you trust God that He'll take care of you. And uh, that's what He's saying right there. And so she's an icon because she wa Abraham was afraid. She wasn't afraid. Study that and see if that's not what that's saying. It seems to me that's an, at least one interpretation of that passage.